Jennifer McDonald. I'm the manager of, co of uh, impact investing at CoPower. Uh, and as Rob mentioned, uh, my background is on the institutional portfolio management side. So uh, Phillips Hager and North is the institutional assets of RBC, Global Asset Management. And throughout the four years that I was with them, I started to hear from clients, institutional and retail investors, who were asking for more green investments, who were asking for what else did you have outside of the traditional mutual funds and your traditional ETFs. And I joined CoPower last year, twofold. One reason because it aligns very much with my own personal beliefs uh, about investing in a greener future. Uh, and as well, for me, the writing really is on the wall. So if it's at a community scale, uh, and specifically I'll dive into on an individual, um, for your investment portfolios, on an individual or retail level, what other options do you have? So. Let's get started. So I'll start with uh, the case for clean energy investing. So there's a, a very specific market opportunity that CoPower is focused on, so I'll describe that. And then I'll run through some of the projects that we funded, and then I'll talk about, again, some investing options specifically for individuals. So CoPower was founded with a mission to empower Canadians to invest in the clean energy transition, both for profit and for planet. So we specialize in providing access to the small scale energy projects and we package all that portfolio of loans into investment products that are available for retail investors to put into their portfolios. And the market opportunity for small scale projects is quite large. So here in the city of Edmonton, 52% of the city's emissions comes from its built environment. So that's more than transportation, and it's more than waste, and it's more than all the products that you buy and sell. It's the heating and cooling in all of the buildings that we work in, the universities, and all of our houses and condo buildings that we live in. And this number is much higher than it has to be. So the heating and cooling as well as all of the electricity. So Edmonton has a population of approximately 900,000, so it, it is one of the largest cities in Canada, and you can see it from space. So again, we have the proven technologies that can help get this emissions from our built environment reduced. So in the case of LED, uh, many countries had mandated the phasing out of incandescent inefficient light bulbs uh, over a decade ago. And since 2010, the price of an LED bulb has fallen by 90% and the lifetime of that bulb has increased by 84%. I pulled this uh, graphic from the City of Calgary has a, a greenhouse gas emission reduction plan. The City of Edmonton also has one. But the point is, on the left-hand side, if you're going to look and target reducing emissions, the most economic, the, the, the projects that you can tackle first, the lowest hanging fruit, are energy efficiency projects. So the average from built environment emissions across Canada is 30%. So it's lower than Edmonton's 52, but still it's higher than it has to be. So we have LED projects, we have energy efficiency, and we have solar, and yet two thirds of all the small scale projects don't get up off the ground. So the small scale project developers don't have the same access to finance that the larger project developers do. They also, uh, tend to need someone who understands the technology and understands um, the energy project. And they also, unlike the large project developers, they need a nimble and a flexible financing approach. So the banks or your larger lenders tend to have a very formulaic way of investing that doesn't fit some of the smaller project developers. So the other market opportunity that CoPower is focused on is the sourcing of capital. So seven out of 10, uh, retail invest seven out of ten people in in Canada and North America are interested in sustainable and impact investing and again in reality less than one percent of individuals actually take that next step and it's fair to say that up until a few years ago uh, impact investments were really for large uh, Canadian pension plans or large asset managers um, large managers with capital that could fund the projects themselves so CoPower is identifying these two markets. So on the left-hand side, there's the market opportunity that all of the small-scale project developers need access to finance. And on the right-hand side, it's the investors. So 
the regular retail investors that want to invest directly in the product. So over the last four years, we've developed and continue to improve our online investing platform. So that's helped us scale to where we are now, and because we've made it easy and accessible for Canadians to invest, it's going to allow us, hopefully, to, to continue to scale. So sorry that's uh, a little bit darker uh, than I thought, but this is, uh, these are all of our investors across Canada. So we have an office in Toronto and we have an office in Montreal, but half of our clients, half of our investor base is west of Ontario. So with our online platform and thanks to the benefits of technology that have allowed financial services to grow, we've been able to get uh, to where we are today. So to date we've placed over 14 million in clean energy loans and we have approximately 350 individual investors across Canada. So now some of the projects that we've financed. So again, because of the, the economics of energy efficiency projects are quite large, so it helps us, one of the reasons why we can offer such great interest rates for the projects um, and for our green bond holders. So when, when we're financing uh, portfolios of LED projects, we enable the LED firm to offer zero money down installation to the condo board. And Rob, you mentioned it before, a lot of project developers don't have access to that capital. And if you were at the solar drinks with me earlier, there was quite a few, uh, there was quite a few people that mentioned this as well. So we refinance it once the project's done, and then the LED firm can take that capital and then go do more and more projects. The condo board, who didn't have that money lying around, pays for the pays down the loan each month in uh, in amounts that are less than the energy savings that they're getting. So typically for LED portfolios, the payback is between three and four years, so it's very quick. Everyone is impact positive and cash flow positive from day one. So these are the types of win-win-win projects that we're looking for and that our investors want to be a part of. So to date, uh, I mentioned that we've placed over 14 million. These are projects that are currently in our green bond fund right now. So on the left-hand side, again, the economics for LED retrofits are quite strong and that's why they are the majority, the majority of projects that are in the portfolio. So to date, our green bond uh, our green bondholders have helped to finance over 240 condo buildings in Canada and that represents over 22,000 individual tenants or individual units. In the middle is our residential geo exchange program in Quebec. And so in total, uh, we financed a $1 million loan that when finished will help 100 houses in retail Montreal get off of their oil system, which is um, the main source of their heating and cooling, and go to a much cleaner heating and cooling system. So we've partnered with a company called Marmot, who again acts like a mini utility, so they're able to offer zero money down to the homeowner. And so for those of you that are aware of geo exchange or geothermal, these systems can be quite expensive. So they can be anywhere from forty to $50,000, which a lot of homeowners don't have access to. So the homeowner pays down the loan each month with the money that they're saving from their energy bills. And lastly, uh, the solar project in Ontario that's about a week away from going into the portfolio. Um, that is, uh, has a FIT contract in Ontario, which some of you uh, may know, but it, it has a purchase price agreement for the next 20 years. So as we continue to grow, uh, we'll continue to build out our portfolio pipeline. And the main goal for our bondholders, it, it's beneficial to build out and diversify across the technology and across the geography. So we are developer agnostic and technology agnostic. So we don't specifically favor one technology over the other. Um, rather, we'd like to pull as many clean energy levers as we can. So currently right now, yes, yeah, solar does make up the most of it. And the more solar panels we can fund, that's great. But at the same time, we need the funding for battery storage. Vertical farming is uh, one of the new projects um, that we've identified that, that might fit. Um, and it's really interesting. Uh, if you can grow your food at one-eighth 
of the energy that it takes on a regular farm and you can use one tenth of the water, it can have very material energy savings. So it's all of these technologies combined that is really going to help Canada to get to a cleaner future. So again, we diversify by geography as well. So many of you uh, are very well aware that the carbon intensity in Alberta and Saskatchewan is, are the greatest uh, across Canada. So uh, depending on uh, which geography you are, British Columbia and Quebec are, are blessed with a lot of hydro, so their carbon intensity is much less. And you can see that um, uh, by flipping a switch on in Alberta, uh, it's 10 times uh, more carbon impactful than flipping a switch in Ontario, 50 times more carbon than flipping a switch in BC, and over 300 times more impactful than flipping a switch in Quebec. We ourselves had this example when our LED portfolio was approximately 3.5 million. We were um, identifying the total carbon reductions of that amount. At the time, the Alberta projects uh, were only 5% of the total portfolio. So we did our carbon calculation on BC and Ontario, and we found that for 3.5 million, our total carbon reduction was 460 tons a year, which is fantastic. It's the equivalent of taking 100 cars off the road. When we went back and added 5% of the project, so it was from Alberta, the carbon, uh, the carbon reductions per year increased to 750 tons, the equivalent of taking 160 cars off the road each year. And so it's very important to note that it was just 5% of the portfolio, but it rep represented 40% of the carbon impact. And for this reason, we continue to look for projects in Alberta. So right now, we've identified uh, over 20 million in projects here for the next couple of years, representing approximately 11% of our project portfolio. So some of that is more energy efficiency, LED, uh, as well as, um, as, well as some, some small natural gas uh, projects. So that's a little bit about us. Uh, and if you have questions, you can come see me after or ask later. Um, but when I was asked by Rob to come, um, part, of it, part of it was due to my background, but also part of it was just to talk about for individual investors, what are, what are the options that you have for your portfolio? So right now, I'm just going to pretend that all of you are here specifically to talk about what you can do in your portfolio. And so let's start with where you are right now. We released a thought leadership uh, paper. It's on our website if you want in November. And using all public data, we found that the average Canadian's investment portfolio has a greater carbon footprint than the actual Canadian investor themselves. So for background, each of us have, a, have an average carbon footprint of approximately 21 tons a year. So part of that is made up from our houses, so it's about three to four tons. The majority comes from our transportation. So between eight to 12 tons per year comes from the cars we drive, how much we depend on our car versus public transportation, and also how much we travel by plane. So are we traveling a lot for work? Are we traveling a lot for vacation? Uh, so the point is, it's, it's approximately 21, 21 tons. And so for those people that are aware and are interested in how to lower their carbon footprint, one of the first things that you can do is take a look at your carbon portfolio. So often I hear from clients who have gone to their financial advisor and they've been asked, oh, I'm, I'm interested in divesting, I, I want to lower my carbon footprint. And a lot of advisors will say, well, you know, hang on, take a look in your own life and see, see what you can do. And the fact of the matter is, your investment portfolio is probably having a greater impact uh, than you yourself are. And so the, the uh, I guess the kind of baseline, for any investment portfolio amount of greater than 300,000, it's gonna have a greater carbon footprint. So that those larger investment portfolio amounts might not be applicable to everyone in this room, but just a thought as you're planning your retirement and you're planning your savings, it's something to think about. And so do you know what you own? So through your registered accounts, through your savings accounts, do you currently know 
what you own. So a lot of us, when we sign up to a new company, we're, we're put in just an average company retirement plan. So sometimes we'll be put in lifetime funds or mutual funds, funds that we don't actually know what's in it. We use the example of our marketing manager, Lauren. She's worked at CoPower for two years, and before that, she's always worked at social good companies. And for Lauren, when she started at CoPower, she took a look at her portfolio, and she was shocked to find that she was invested in oil and gas, sorry, Alberta, tobacco, uh, and defense companies, including Lockheed Martin, which is, a, which is a maker of cluster bombs. And Lauren was just so surprised that her portfolio completely didn't represent her as a person. And so it's something I know a lot of you are probably here because you're interested about where to put your capital and you want to align your capital with your own investment beliefs. So it's just something to think about. So there is a growing market of investment opportunities for you. So there's going to be some co-ops uh, talking later, and they're fantastic at a community level of getting engagement, and they provide some very strong um, investment opportunities. Outside of that, even in terms of the public markets, there is a growing amount of either green mutual funds or, um, or even index funds. So really quickly on a, on a scale, there's quite a lot of terms out there that can be confusing. On the left hand side, uh, you've probably heard of socially responsible investing. And the way to think about SRI funds is really like a screen. So you, the traditional screen is the SIN stock. So you can take out um, tobacco, alcohol, gambling, and defense companies. But at the end of the day, SRI, you have a screen and you're going to take out the worst. So you're trying to get uh, the, the worst out of the index. The next step is ESG investing. So active portfolio managers are going to use environmental, social, and governance factors to choose the best stocks out of a sector and make a portfolio out of that. So instead of getting rid of the worst, you're choosing the best out of a sector. And then further down the line, you have impact investing. So you're saying, I'm kind of do away with the traditional index of what's available. I'm actually, I actually want to invest or put my money towards a solution. So it's most of the time it's in private markets, so they're private placements. But you're looking for an attractive rate of return, so you have to have that. But as well, the impact investment piece, you have to have some sort of measurable benefit. If it's social, it could be social community bonds, so it could be the number of social houses that get put on the market. If it's environmental, it could be carbon offsets or new clean energy produced or trees planted. It has to have some other measurable benefit. And so from a carbon footprint level, when you're looking at your traditional investing, and I mentioned that your average portfolio is, is going to be very carbon intensive, when you look at SRI and ESG, they might be less bad, but it's still not part of the solution. So you really have to keep going down the spectrum, either in co-ops or in private placements, to get that additional um, benefit. And for impact investments, the market is growing as well. So I mentioned, you know, up until a few years ago, you really had to be either a large Canadian pension plan or part of a large asset management firm to get access to it. Open Impact is a catalog of impact investments. Um, there's also svx.com, uh, sorry, svx.ca. Uh, they just did uh, their launch 2.0. They're also a catalog, so you can go online, you put in your geography, and based on where you are and what your interests are, it'll give you a list of options for impact investments. Uh, Solar Share is down in the corner. Uh, it's available for Ontario residents, but it's similar to the other co-ops that are available um, in terms of putting locally, uh, locally sourced projects and small-scale projects on and have it funded by by the community, by people that can actually see it and touch it. So often when I'm talking about impact investments, um, one of the main myths that I hear is, well, I'm, I'm just one person, like I, I'm too small to make a difference. This is Haley, and Haley is our youngest green bond investor. Haley is 16 and she's from Calgary. Um, Haley was spending her uh, summers working at Booster Juice and she was saving up for university. And she wanted to put her, uh, her hard-earned money into something until she needed it in university. 
So she went online and she found us. And the story of Haley uh, inspires a lot of us at CoPower because we think it's really indicative of the future and the future generation. So for them, they don't even, um, individuals like Haley, you know, she didn't even want to hear what a mutual fund or what an ETF could look like. She wanted to, she wanted to invest directly in something that she believed in. So just really quickly, uh, our CoPower green bonds, uh, we've, uh, I'll just kind of highlight on, on the structure. So when we invest in a project, we only invest in assets that are already operating already hard on the ground so that we don't want any construction risk. We have uh, a team that works uh, specifically on the projects that do all the due diligence. A lot of them have come from energy development companies. They continue to do the monitoring and make sure that all of the specs are in place before and during our investment. Online monitoring, as I said, our online investment platform has really been the key to where we've gotten to today. So we don't have the traditional distribution centers like a CIBC branch or, or any main branch where you just go in and, and you talk to a financial advisor. We use e-signature and everything is done online. And diversification, we, our co-power green bonds are a private placement, so they don't trade in the market. There's no secondary market, so you do have to hold throughout the, matur the maturity of the bond. But because it doesn't look like anything else in your portfolio, it provides strong diversification benefits. And lastly, the carbon reduction piece. So um, through our online platform, you can log into your account, and our investors can go to check the interest that they're earning, but as well how much carbon they're offsetting. This is Dr. Joe Vapond. Uh, Dr. Vapond is also a Calgary resident. Uh, he is an emergency physician and has been for 17 years. And uh, Dr. Vapond has been part of CAPE, which is the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. Uh, and so Dr. Vapond is a big environmental activist. Um, he's been an investor with us uh, uh, for a couple of years now. Um, but he represents uh, a, the majority of our client base. So they, they want to invest in something that they believe in, but they, you know, they don't necessarily want to do the day-to-day -day trading. So for Dr. Vapond, it's a small part of his portfolio, but he can invest in it and feel good about it and, and not have to touch it. So... When, when you're comparing a, a green bond to what else is out there in the, fixed, in, in the world of fixed income, again, this is going to be for the fixed income allocation of your portfolio. Um, the baseline bond that you're going to compare it to is a Bank of Canada. So the Bank of Canada bond is the most liquid bond. It's the most abundant bond. And for a five-year bond, you're going to get approximately 1.9%. So it's not really that great. Uh, TD did a large green bond issuance last year as did the city, well, city of Ottawa was smaller. Um, they did a 30-year bond at 3.3, which is actually very low, but that got snapped up pretty quickly by the institution. So both the TD and the city of Ottawa are pretty hard to invest in yourself if you're a retail investor. Our co-power green bonds, again, the economics of the projects that we're investing in is one of the reasons that we can offer such a high rate of return. And as well, it's the illiquidity premium. So because you do have to hold it for the three or five years, you're getting compensated for that. And because we are in a low interest rate environment, um, anytime you move greater than five to 6%, you're gonna have to move into the high yield territory. So a high yield bond is called high yield. Um, once the company has a significant level of default risk. So, so as you go on the spectrum, as you're reaching for yield, there is an additional risk associated with it. So again, back to the question of kind of why I do what I do and why I come to groups and I speak to individual investments. The size of the Canadian retail investment market, so this is all Canadians and, and all of their savings, is approximately three trillion. If all Canadians allocated 5 to 10% of their portfolios. That's between 150 billion and 300 billion of financing that we could put towards clean energy projects, which collectively, as a group, really matters. And, and my last stat I have for you is in 2017, all of the LED bulbs that have been put into place 
um, have saved carbon, uh, carbon emissions of 570 million tons. So that's in one year and that's across the globe. That's equivalent to, uh, to taking offline 162 cold fire power plants. So again, just the idea that everyone collectively can make a huge, huge difference. And that's it for me. So, like Rob mentioned, my name's Kabir. I'm a student at the U of A. Uh, and for the past eight months, I was working with the Pemina Institute um, on work related to community energy and distributed generation here in the province of Alberta. Um, and so one of the main projects that I worked on was Alberta's Community Solar Guide. Um, and it's essentially a 50-page guide regarding um, a whole bunch of different topics re uh, related to community solar. And it's meant for community groups or various community members or cooperatives that are looking to create community energy projects uh, within Alberta and, and are looking for further guidance on this. Um, but it can also be used by um, established co-ops or, or renewable project developers that are looking to market their projects to Albertan communities. Um, and so the guide is available on, on our website, so feel free to check it out. Um, and in terms of Pemina, the Pemina Institute is a not-for-profit not think tank um, that does work related to clean energy across, uh, across the country here in Canada. Um, and we do a bunch of work related to renewables uh, here in Alberta. And we have been focusing on community energy specifically because it's a really interesting um, keystone for, for um, Albertans to be able to engage with renewables unlike any other type of renewable project. And so that's the guide. Feel free to have a look later. Um, but essentially today I'll just be summarizing various parts of it and alluding to, um, you know, bedtime reading, hopefully. Um, so in terms of community solar, what is community solar? Um, so community solar is, uh, it's a new and um, kind of flexible ownership model for solar PV. Um, and it gives access to um, a whole bunch of new Albertans who might not have been able to access solar PV previously. So for example, um, as a student myself, I don't own a house, and yet I am quite inclined to invest in solar. And so through community solar, for example, I might be able to have that option. Um, other groups that it, uh, that it could potentially um, create access for include renters, um, low-income communities, um, houses with bad shading conditions, um, and uh, as well as kind of farmers who might be looking to repurpose some of their land um, and so on. Um, in terms of uh, its benefits, uh, so community solar uh, creates better engagement than any other type of renewable project because it, it kind of lies between um, the rooftop solar and the utility scale solar um, model. Um, and so this means that you might have a distribution connected solar project within your neighborhood that you see, but that you might not necessarily have to maintain and take care of yourself. Other, uh, other benefits include kind of flexible community contributions and returns. So this means that now if there's a community solar project that you are a member of or a subscriber with, um, you don't have to spend a whole lot of your own upfront money to um, develop it. and, and Instead, you could just pay a smaller fee um, to perhaps own or access the electricity from a quarter of a panel, let's say. Um, and so that's just an example of how it can be really flexible. Uh, and then in terms of the returns, um, it can also be quite flexible depending on the nature of the project. So for example, certain projects might choose to return the money to its investors um, by by, for example, just sending them checks in the mail or other projects that are more integrated with the retail utility um, might um, actually provide credits on the electricity bill itself. And so it can take many different forms and, and so I'll be getting to the different business models um, further down in this presentation. Um, but I think um, in, in terms of the other benefits, I think we've gone over some of them. So they provide green investment opportunities that might not have existed before, um, that clearly there's a lot of us who are interested in in, in uh, these types of opportunities. Uh, in terms of the grid and where community solar might integrate, um, so this is a very kind of high level picture of, of the electricity grid. As you can see, you have the transmission grid, which is the high voltage centralized 
um, system that brings power from those centralized gas and coal plants um, into your neighborhoods. And so oftentimes um, you might have large scale renewables such as um, large wind farms or even sometimes solar farms um, that connect onto the transmission grid themselves. So the transmission connected utility scale renewables is what we call them. Um, these would be in, in the range of hundreds of megawatts often. Um, the other types of renewables, uh, and, and those are the ones that we are focusing on and calling community solar. Um, these include distribution connected renewables. So um, for example, a solar farm or a solar garden that is between one and 10 megawatts that is connected to the distribution grid. So the, the wooden poles that are lower voltage that bring the electricity from the substations to your neighborhoods and transformer boxes. Um, so those would be distribution connected projects. Uh, and then you have the rooftop solar projects as well. So this could be um, behind the meter projects uh, on community facilities like halls, um, like for example, a large farm um, or a school within a neighborhood um, or municipally owned facilities as well. And so that would be kind of the more traditional rooftop model that I think most people are familiar with. Now in terms of a case study, just to make this tangible for you, uh, I, I chose to do a case study on SolarShare, which is a successful community solar co-op based out of Ontario, and there's many like these elsewhere as well. Um, but this one is specifically, it's a distribution connected project, uh, and, and SolarShare owns 18 different projects across the province of Ontario that they've developed over the past eight years. Um, and overall, this is what their projects look like. So you have the system's owner, which is SolarShare themselves, and they'll often develop a project on a community facility, such as a school or a farm that they have a license agreement with um, to use that roof or land space. Um, and then from there, they will acquire uh, subscribers, so community participants, and these could, I, I think for SolarShare, it's any, Al or any Ontarian can invest with them. Um, and they essentially start off by paying a small membership fee or upfront payment, which is, uh, much lower than the upfront to actually develop a large scale solar um, project um, or even a rooftop solar project. Um, and so once they've paid that membership, uh, uh, SolarShare will use those membership fees and other grants um, or funding that they might have or other capital that they have as a group themselves um, and develop the project. And the electricity that results from the, the solar farm um, or the, or the micro generation facility, um, they will sell to the utility or um, the retailer. And so in Ontario, um, the Ontario Power Authority ends up purchasing all of their electricity. Um, and in return um, for that electricity, um, SolarShare or the, the owner of that system ends up earning payments uh, in the form of, of FIT payments. Um, and, and, and keep in mind that there's also obviously a bank involved to develop the project, but oftentimes uh, if SolarShare is established, they don't need to do that. Um, and once all this money is returned to SolarShare from OPA, they return the money in the form of dividends to the community participants. And so I think the way SolarShare returns this money is they, they provide checks every six months to each of their participants um, over the span of the investment. So that's just one example, but there's several other examples available in the case studies uh, at the end of the, of the solar guide. So feel free to have a look at that. Uh, in terms of the project economics and the various components that make up the value of electricity coming from a solar array, um, you can have distribution connected um, projects. Uh, there we go. Uh, the distribution connected projects, which are standalone, they don't have a load associated with them, and so all of the electricity that they're producing throughout the day ends up getting exported into the grid. Um, and then you have your micro generation projects, so these are um, projects that would be on top of a facility that has a load, so a school or a community hall, et cetera. And so these have a load throughout the day. Um, and at times where the, the amount of electricity that you're producing exceeds the amount of electricity that you need for the load, that excess electricity gets exported into the grid. Um, but at other times, the electricity that you're producing uh, helps offset your, uh, the amount that you purchase from the grid. Um, in terms of the compensation, you can have compensation in the form of retail electricity, which is oftentimes in Alberta a flat rate, or you could have it at the wholesale rate, which reflects hourly pricing. Um, and and the different types of projects can access different types of compensation for just the electricity. 
But on top of just the electricity, there are other components that um, solar electricity is capable of um, earning um, here in Alberta. And so this includes credits for the transmission or distribution um, offsets. So if, if you have a large enough distribution connected project, let's say, that ends up um, deferring infrastructure upgrades for your local utility, um, then they might be able to provide you with credits for that, but this depends on the utility. And so if you're developing a community solar project or a distribution generation project, you should be inquiring about that. Um, apart from that, other, another really important component of the value comes from the long-term price hedge. So when you're purchasing electricity that comes from natural gas or, or kind of a more traditional model of electricity and source, then you don't really know what, what to expect in the next 30 years. Whereas if you have a solar project, uh, you know right now um, how much your electricity is going to cost and, and the certainty has a lot of value as well for, for especially a lot of corporations. Um, and then apart from the long-term price hedge, you have the environmental attributes. So you can access um, these environmental attributes in many different forms here in Alberta. It can be done through um, the Esker credits, which has a market for carbon offsets. Um, you can also access various grants. Um, some of them, most of them are actually upfront grants, but um, there might be a possibility for long-term grants for distribution and community projects as well. Um, and then apart from these components, there are other, com other considerations in terms of how you can go about um, creating this long-term value proposition for your project. Um, and so this includes power purchase agreements, it includes um, various government subsidies, uh, includes standard offer programs and feed-in tariffs, which might be a future possibility in Alberta. Um, and then another really important consideration is looking at the payback period of your project and seeing whether it actually pays off before the end of life of the project. Because if it doesn't, then this is not a good idea to develop. Um, but these are all discussed in much more detail in the guide. Um, in terms of the regulations that affect various types of community solar projects, um, I've divided it up into the microgeneration projects, which are once again behind the meter projects, as well as distribution connected projects. Um, and so for microgeneration, uh, the, the relevant regulation here in Alberta is a microgeneration regulation under the Alberta U Utilities Act. Um, and essentially, a microgenerator can only have uh, enough, or it can only produce enough electricity to offset the total load um, per year and, and no more. Um, whereas a distribution uh, connected generator is not, does not have a load and so therefore doesn't have that type of limitation. Um, however, the scales of the microgenerators are, so for the small microgenerators, it's zero to 150 kilowatts, whereas for a larger one, it can go as high as five megawatts. Or yeah, five megawatts, whereas a distribution generator can be as large as 10 megawatts. Um, and the distribution generator is regulated mainly by the Alberta Utilities Commission um, and Rule 7 of, of the commission. Um, but you can have a look at those. And, and another big difference is that small microgen um, earns money through the retail market, whereas large microgen and distribution gen earns money through the wholesale market. Um, so overall, communi uh, community solar any type of community solar project will adopt this type of business model, right? So you have the participants who include subscribers, a local government who might choose to become a member of, of the group or of, of the project, uh, as well as any community entities that are tied to the project, um, who participate in the project and earn money. Um, and the generator who kind of organizes a lot of this and, and will export the electricity to the utility. And the utility will return the value either to the generator themselves and then through them to the community participants or directly to the community participants through their electricity bills. Um, and then you have optional involvement from governments, the developers, and the financial institutions that might also be involved. Um, and so overall, there's a long checklist of steps to develop your community solar project. I'm not gonna go into too much detail about this right now, but uh, for anyone looking to kind of initiate such a project and, and kind of work with a renewable developer and um, kind of invite a whole bunch of stakeholders into their project. These are the very steps that are involved and um, they're all quite important. So I, I recommend that you have a look. Um, and so that kind of covers the overall content of the guide, um, but some other important considerations um, going forward with regards to the community solar discussion here in Alberta. Um, one of them includes the Alberta Utilities Com Commission's um, review on distribu distributed generation, which has been happening over the past year, and it's a 
um, and a public, there was a public hearing with a whole bunch of stakeholders who provided their input on topics such as the billing systems, rates and tariffs, um, the costs and barriers that are associated with developing uh, DG projects. Um, and so this hearing happened throughout the year and there was a report provided to the Minister of Energy in December of this past year and we're yet to, we're yet to hear where this is going. Um, and so if you are interested in this, you can definitely get in touch with the government yourself. Um, and then another big, big aspect of, of um, the DG and community energy um, piece uh, here in Alberta is um, how exactly we are valuing um, the electricity from DG projects. Um, and so by this we're alluding to, uh, for example, in, in New York, um, they tried this new method of, of compensating um, solar, uh, which is called a value of distributed energy resources. Um, and so this is coming in to replace net metering, and it's essentially breaking down um, the value of this electricity into all of its different components and assigning value to things such as time of use as well as a locational value of this electricity, which are all really important considerations when, when choosing to incentivize a project versus not. Um, and so um, there have been small discussions of this topic here in Alberta. Um, however, running such a study to really see what areas offer the best value to the grid is a long-term proposition. And so in the short term, we might have to look at things such as, um, such as standard, offered pro standard offer programs, which might be a more immediate uh, way of getting community energy projects on, online. And so that brings us to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your time and feel free to check out the guide. We are, as you heard, SPICE, uh, the Solar Power Investment Cooperative of Edmonton. We have a mandate of creating a sustainable, a sustain, a sustainable energy for all um, initiative. So currently we are actually working, our vision is to work with um, unleashing local capital to help progress the solar industry here in Alberta itself, but specifically in Edmonton. Um, and yeah, that is, that's our, we're the one-stop shop bringing together investors, local community, um, property owners, and um, our government officials, sorry, as well as our uh, electricity grid. And I'll just get into, thank you. Sorry guys, just improving a little bit here. Okay, so SPICE today, just so you can learn a little bit about our organization. In 2012, we actually got word developed by, CISA, by uh, board members of CISA, um, which is, as you know, the Solar Energy Society of Alberta. Um, we incorporated in 2015. In, from 2012 to 2017, just to go back a bit, our board was actually recruited by Warren himself. Um, and basically, we are eight board members that um, come from various areas and disciplines. Uh, equipped to help create these investment solutions for uh, Edmonton. We do actually, I know um, it was mentioned about Dr. Joe Vipond, we do actually have one of our uh, board members on the same CAPE committee um, as well as the Cole phase out. Uh, she works on a project, Dr. Raquel Ferro. Um, and we have a few other board members in the audience, so I'll just ask them for a quick moment to stand up and wave just because they are your local community and you might want to come and ask some questions after. So just for a moment, if you could stand up and say hello. So we have three of them here and one in the back there. And there's Gordon. Okay, Gordon Howell, many of you all know him. Okay, so presently we are working with potential partners such as the City of Edmonton, the Government of Alberta, and other corporates to move our initial projects that you'll start seeing in the latter half of the year forward. Um, as of February 2018, we do ask you to keep your eyes open because you will see us come and launch. We have a soft launch schedule for the 1st of February um, where we will be doing a membership drive and then further um, on we will be announcing our uh, hard launch or official launch. So as I was talking about, we are currently working, the main, the main uh, area we're working in is capacity building. So that means currently we've received fundings from completed projects. We've done some projects with the Edmonton Foundation Community League. Um, we have also done consultancy services, uh, mainly Warren and some of our other senior members have done consulting services for the City of Edmonton and other uh, organizations alike. We've also had um, in-kind investments and in, in private grants as well. Currently, we're pursuing funding from government programming, membership, completed projects, and corporate PPAs. 
So what everybody wants to know, how it works. So we're going to just give you a brief overview right now. We won't go into details on the investments itself, but we'll give you an idea of kind of the structure of our cooperative. So currently right now we are bringing in property owners who want solar on the rooftop um, to come and talk to us about what their, um, what their wants um, in this whole um, situation is and also um, understand and help have us facilitate their um, process of development. So they don't need any knowledge. This is, not, this is where our board and our um, team will be able to take care of them. Um, they, but they come to SPICE and then investors will come and start investing. So they could, you could divest, so you could take away, as was said earlier, investments that are in oil and gas and put them into a clean energy investment, sorry, oil and gas, um, or other, other investment options. You, but you can do this with an RSP or TFSA because they are eligible. So that means that you do also have the tax savings benefits. Um, and then we, uh, we will ultimately have this community energy option. So what community energy is, just to give you a brief overview, you, you will hear this more in depth from Kabir later. Um, but community energy means it is local projects in your home, in your, um, in your locality itself, so Edmonton, um, that you get to see and understand and be involved in. So member revenue opportunity, the places where you as a member would make revenue is in electricity sales, uh, membership fees, project investment, renewable, renewable energy certificates, donations, grants, investor fees, and shareholders. So to be a member, it's $25 a year. You have then access to local competitive green investment opportunities, a vote and impact to a local green, green investment cooperative, SPICE, um, and an ownership share. And if you have questions about that, just keep those for later because Warren will be answering those questions for you. And then the investor revenue opportunity. So basically, as an investor, you do have a portfolio of projects that you'll be able to invest in. Those projects are currently in development, so we won't be announcing that now, but again, you will hear, that, hear more about that in the latter half of this year. Um, in the end of this pro uh, presentation, we do have an email on, listed on our thank you page. And you can take that down and inquire um, or send us your email and we can always put you on our updates as well. So essentially what you would see is a portfolio of projects. So they could be, the, a few of them that we're working on currently are solar PV projects, um, storage projects, innovation projects, and wind projects. And I, uh, we did obviously hear a little bit about what Coal Power is doing. It's similar, um, but again, on a local scale. So that is it for me um, and what I'm presenting to you tonight. I thank you so much for your attention. Again, as I said, there is an email if you have any questions or want to receive the updates on our launch. As well, you can follow us on LinkedIn or add us to LinkedIn and follow us on Facebook. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about Group Solar, which is a new uh, community solar initiative that we've just recently launched. So I'll give you a bit of an overview on Group Solar. Uh, talk a little bit about the, uh, the investment terms and a, and a high level overview of the financial analysis. Talk about Group Solar Retail Co, which makes the whole thing work, uh, and then tell you about some of the next steps to execute on the project. So what is Group Solar? Group Solar is a for-profit community solar initiative where multiple parties uh, will each own a fractional interest in a, a large ground mount utility scale solar project located in southern Alberta. Uh, investors uh, and slash owners can take their power anywhere in the province and in doing so they can effectively uh, they will effectively have the option to lock in today's rates for the whole 25-year asset life uh, and they can cancel any time if they don't want to take their power and just want to sell it into the Alberta power pool they can do that too investors are projected to earn a, a pre-tax cash yield of, of six and a half percent over each year over the 25-year life of the investment, which translates to a little over a 4% internal rate of return. We'll talk a bit more about that. So the first project uh, that, that we'd like to do is the Vauxhall Solar Project. So it's in southern Alberta. If you haven't heard of Vauxhall, uh, it's close to the town of Tabor or Lethbridge. Um, it's, uh, it's adjacent to the Vauxhall substation. It's scalable from 11 to 16 megawatts AC. Uh, it received its AUC permit in July of 2017. Uh, and so we've optioned about 150 acres of land 
the design involves approximately 50,000 solar modules, five inverter and transformer stations, and the project is shovel ready. Like I say, the land is optioned, uh, the interconnection process is almost complete, and all permits are in place. So how is Group Solar different? Uh, group Solar is profitable. So the way we've set it up is it's a for-profit entity. Uh, your investment is expected to have a payback of 15 years. Uh, and as I mentioned before, it's, uh, it, it'll deliver a 6.5% a annual cash on cash yield, uh, which translates into a, an internal rate of return over the project life of, of a little over 4% before taxes. And Group Solar is portable. So the concept is that individuals would invest, they would own their own pro rata share of the generation, and they would take delivery at their home or business or farm. Uh, it's set up such that the purchases are done kind of at the current market rates for electricity. And that's, that's what allows, um, that's what drives the, uh, the, the, the returns. And if you ever leave Alberta or you don't want to take delivery of the power at your home or business because you like your current retailer, that's fine too. Uh, like I said, you can sell, we can sell the uh, output into the Al Alberta power pool for you. So the benefits, obviously the revenue sources, uh, which there are three, there are electricity sales, there are sales of CO2 offsets under Alberta's off um, output based allocation system and then there are uh, distribution credits which you earn for being distribution connected in Alberta under the regulations. In addition to um, the profitability, uh, Group Solar investors also benefit from being able to fix the price of their electricity for the next 25 years. So they're effectively hedged. Um, We'll also provide uh, a customized mobile and desktop application that'll provide some real-time energy analytics with a smart home electricity monitor. Um, it's very flexible. Like I said, you can take the delivery of your power anywhere in Alberta. Um, and of course, it's, it's environmentally conscious. Everybody can generate as much solar electricity uh, as they consume you know, in their home or business or farm. So the, the structure, you'll see there, um, this works. So the, the, it'll be a limited partnership that will own the solar assets. Those solar assets will generate uh, electricity and through the Alberta Power Pool provide electricity to individual homeowners slash investors. They'll pay for that electricity uh, based on current market prices, which for a long-term uh, contract right now is six, about six and a half cents a kilowatt hour. The money from that electricity purchase will go back to Group Solar LP and be distributed back out to unit holders as profit. So they'll get a quarterly distribution. So financial analysis and the LP investment terms. So each limited partnership unit is priced at $2,000 per unit. Uh, so we have a minimum of five LP units for an investment which is $10,000, and that represents generation of around 8,200 kilowatt hours per year. There's no upper limit on the investment, and 8,200 kilowatt hours per year is representative of the amount of electricity that the typical detached home in Alberta would consume. Uh, as I mentioned, distributions will be paid out quarterly uh, and will be determined for each uh, limited partner based on, you know, formulaically based on their generation consumption at home, surplus sales to grid, less market purchases. Um, and from a securities point of view, this investment will be a, a non-brokered private placement by Group Solar, and it'll be marketed under, uh, under the accredited investor and offering memorandum prospectus exemptions. Just some of the very high level economics. Again, a $10,000 investment provides a, a pre-tax internal rate of return over the life, the 25 year life of the asset of 4.3%, and that's uh, a 15-year payback after tax, uh, assuming a average tax rate for a $100,000 per year income earner. So you can see in the table down here that uh, cash distributions vary a little bit, uh, but uh, on, on average works out to about a 6.5% cash on cash yield. So invest $10,000, get $650 a year in, uh, in, in distributions on average over 25 years. As part of this, we'll be setting up uh, an entity called Group Solar Retail Co, uh, which will essentially manage all the balancing and, and settlement and billing operations. So as I said before, we'll, the way it's set up is electricity consumers will purchase electricity from their owned generation at the current long-term market price, which is six and a half cents per kilowatt hour. And that's a 
7 by 24 price for all their requirements. Um, we'll perform the power balancing, which I'll talk a bit more about in a second. And as I mentioned before, if people don't want to take delivery of their own electricity and just sell it into the market, we can do that too. Of course, the rates of return will be a little more unpredictable because you'll be more dependent on, on market prices as opposed to your own consumption. So just the, the, the power balancing and, and what the, uh, the retail company will be doing, um, this is a typical winter uh, supply and consumption profile. And you can see there's your typical household consumption, peaks up in the electricity rush hour, 6 or 7 or 8 p.m., solar generation, peaks obviously during the day. Uh, so at night when the sun's not shining, we would be purchasing from market to meet your needs. During the day, you're over-generating. We'll be selling that into market. And then again, in the evening, we'll be purchasing in the market. Uh, on the right side is a typical daily profile. And you can see, obviously, there's a lot more generation in, in the summer. The good news is that when solar is generating and your owned capacity is over-generating relative to your consumption, uh, that tends to correlate to high electricity prices quite well. And so, uh, we will be selling your surplus at high prices and typically buying back in the evening when prices are quite low in Alberta. And all of that profit, that, that spread, um, stays with Group Solar Investors and, uh, and it's part, forms part of the distribution that you get every quarter. So current Alberta retail options, again, for long-term fixed price power, you can see there, there are, uh, there are four, we just pulled four from, um, this is from energyrates.ca website, but you can see there five-year fixed price power uh, between you know, 6.2 and 6.6 .6 cents per kilowatt hour. In addition, most retailers offer a, a green premium. Um, and so there's a kind of a total green electricity price. So project execution, next steps for us. So right now, we're, uh, we just started um, in, in November and we're primarily just building awareness now and doing social media marketing. Um, and inviting people to go to our website and, and just register their interest. No commitment, just register their interest. Um, once we get the required level of interest, um, basically our next steps are a formal hard launch um, during which we'll be sending out offering memorandums and all the required investor subscription documentation. Um, and then interested investors would sign their subscription agreements, deposit funds in our law firm's trust account, we would conclude all of the necessary construction operations and maintenance agreements and other commercial contracts, issue notice to proceed to Canadian Solar for construction. It's about eight month construction period. And then um, you know, we'd achieve commercial operations and, and begin generating and, and commence retail operations. Uh, as far as project construction, it'll be constructed by Canadian Solar Solutions, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of Canadian Solar Inc. Um, Canadian Solar is one of the most experienced global solar contractors uh, have built most of the solar projects in in Canada uh, large-scale utility scale solar projects um, so we'll be entering into a fixed price asset purchase agreement with Canadian solar uh, for the purchase of the Vauxhall project at completion uh, progress payments will be made um, based on the completion of, of certain construction milestones as verified by group solar LPs independent engineer uh, progress payments will be released from uh, Group Solar LP Law Firm's trust account, uh, which will hold the investors' funds, and then there'll be a, a hold back until they meet basically performance tests and certification that the project's complete. Uh, project operations and maintenance, so we'll, we'll be entering into a long-term O&M agreement with Canadian Solar Operations and Maintenance, which is a subsidiary of Canadian Solar, um, and under that operation and maintenance agreement, uh, CSIOM will be responsible for uh, all aspects of, of plant operations and maintenance uh, for a fixed annual fee. And um, so Canadian Solar Operations has a, a operations and maintenance control center in Guelph, Ontario, which is a man manned around the clock and they manage uh, 57 projects in Canada, uh, totaling just about 480 megawatts DC. And then asset management of the solar facility, administration of the LP and all the retail operations will be done by us, Group Solar, also for a fixed annual fee that's all included in in those economics that I showed you. And then, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you'll have access to, um, to a proprietary application 
uh, available on any web connected device and it'll provide uh, real time monitoring of, of your household electricity consumption, generation from your share of the solar plant, Alberta electricity prices and real time revenue generation, you know, historical consumption, trending data analytics. Um, so please go and uh, register your interest now at groupsolar.ca. You can also follow us uh, on Facebook and LinkedIn. This question is directed at Ian. Ian, um, does Group Solar have any interests in any of the subsidiaries or service providers that provide for the design, construction, repair, maintenance of your proposed solar plant? Uh, no, we, we do not. So as you saw, Canadian Solar and their subsidiaries will provide, be providing construction, operations, and maintenance. Uh, so no, we don't. Uh, we own Group Solar uh, Co., which will be the entity that's providing all the you know, project management uh, and administration of the LP. So it's not an umbrella company? Uh, n no, well, we, we hope to have multiple of these projects. We currently in partnership with Canadian Solar, have a portfolio of six uh, large utility-scale projects developed. Mm -hmm. They're all permitted and ready to go. And this is the first one. Right. We're hopeful that it'll be successful and we'll continue with the others. Right. So you got a takeout purchaser when you're done the project. Pardon me? You have a takeout purchaser when you're done the project. Uh, well, no. The individual investors will be the owners. They will purchase their pro rata share, and so. For instance, here we need mm -hmm. between two and three thousand investors mm -hmm. to fund, you know, an eleven to fifteen megawatt solar project. Right. Okay, that's all I have now. Yep. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the presentations. Uh, I'm Bob Gates. I'm uh, interested in, and probably the question is for th three of the presenters, because you have concrete. Uh, investment plans. Um, I'm, I'm interested from pr the perspective of estate planning. So I invest my 10,000 or whatever in it, and then something happens to me. How, what's the liquidity? How do we, how, do, how does my estate uh, realize on the return of the capital? I'll start off. Um, knock on wood, uh, I often hear this, we have uh, a lot of grandparents or, or uh, elderly people that invest. So from an estate point of view, um, you've already designated that in your will. So it's gonna be uh, assumed like all of your other financial instruments. So depending on what your will states. However, we do have some people, we, we do have a beneficiary form that some people wanna sign and designate. So for instance, if you uh, held $10,000 worth of green bonds with us, you can say I want 5,000 to go to my son, 5,000 to go to my daughter. So uh, we have a legal document that, that takes care of that. Yeah, and, and, and in our case, uh, you, would, you would own limited partnership units. So that, that would be the security you own. Um, no, no different than, than, than other you know, private company shares that you may own. They would be form part of your estate and they would go to your, to your beneficiaries who would then you know, collect the distributions from those limited partnership units and own, own the units. So, so there's no secondary market to liquidate the investment? Turn no. it into cash? It, it, I mean, it's, it's difficult. It, it, it's possible that there would be a secondary market like there are uh, in, in, you know, for many private companies, but, but there is e-liquidity. You should, you should assume that, that these securities are not liquid. And similar for co-power. So our bonds are a private placement, and so, so there is no secondary market, and that's one of the reasons why we offer high interest rates, um, but you do have to hold it to maturity. Thank you. More questions? So, so just f in terms of the co-op, it's a little bit different for us because we also fall under the Cooperatives Act, so we have a regulatory framework we have to work under. And uh, we're in what's known as an opportunities development uh, cooperative as well. Um, and, and so we are actually, and we're member owned, so it actually a lot of what we're going to do is going to be determined by our membership, um, which is one of the challenges when you have a lot of members owning you, as you're alluding to as well, right? Um, 
So, so those are mechanisms we're looking at, and, and actually whether we want to have a trust fund set aside to where we can put some money in um, for those kind of eventualities and stuff like that. But I think it's really a, a fairly standard thing within the investment community that this is not, if you had oil and gas stocks, it would be the same, really the same issue, right? Uh, to Jennifer's point, it's really more like of a bond um, comparison rather than an equity stock. So you're not looking at, say, shares in uh, Imperial Oil versus maybe a bond from insur in Imperial Oil or a government bond. Those tend to be more long-term investments. And, and traditionally, they're fixed for a while. And, but there is ways to get in and out of these things. It it's, you know, has to be developed. Can I just ask a question quickly? Mm -hmm. uh, Warren, do you have terms for your co-op shares? Yeah, you know, it's one of the things we kicked around. You know, if you had to say a 20-year term, which could be the life of the project, um, then, you know, that's going to turn off a few people that, you know, um, now there are government bonds that you can buy for that kind of term, which is readily available. So we're probably looking at something in a, a five-year um, mechanism because that is a little more investor friendly. We're also, uh, because our investments are going to be uh, RRSP and TFSA eligible, uh, we're starting on a project uh, soon here with the uh, Alberta Community Cooperatives Association and uh, Service Credit Union, where we're looking at driving some of the costs out of the, what's traditionally known as a MERS, the management expense ratios. Um, they're a little on the high side for us, so our typical, um, in order for a project to be RRSP eligible, you're looking at a $5,000 investment type of thing. Uh, yours are 10, and uh, I'm not sure what your levels are in yours, Jennifer, but um, we would like to open that up a little bit more to uh, retail investors and, and maybe lower it to a $1,000 uh, entry level. And so there's, there's lots of ways you can do that. You can have uh, power purchase agreements where you, uh, if you have the right partner in there, they're, they're actually picking up some of those MERs. Um, you can extend the term of the life of the projects to squeeze a little bit more capital out of it uh, at the back end. Um, and so we're looking at stuff like that because it, it, as a community owned, probably small or level investments, um, we'd like to have give that opportunity as well, you know, that we could have, uh, well, it opens it up a little bit more to the, to, to the average investor, if you want to call it average investor. Now, saying that, if you do already have RSP eligible investments, you can move them over. It's true of of all of these. So you can have shares in Imperial Oil and you can just shift them over to either um, a green bond with co-power or whatever. So you don't even have to come up with extra money, right? So you could have, most people who are saving for retirement anyways have a fair amount of RSPs anyways. And so it's really, to Jennifer's original point, it's, it's really where do you want your money to be, right? And so if you're not comfortable with them being in something you consider to be not aligned with your values, you know, you can easily, without new money, just shift it over. And that's that's what's been missing in the landscape in, in the Canadian investment community, is you haven't had that option in the past. And so I think what, this is what's great about these events, is that you, you start to see different ideas, but I think it all comes from the same place, where we all want to offer something to people where um, you can feel good about where your money is, right? Nice. Next. Hello. Um, my question's for Jennifer. So, you know, I, like you were saying, you need to put your money where it aligns with your values, but a practical investment question as well. Um, what would be, like, the annual fees on the investments put with CoPower? Yeah, sure. So CoPower is a different model, so there's no fees for the investors. So uh, our model is, uh, it's a spread. So what we're loaning out to the projects and to the project developers is higher than the rate of interest that we're giving on the bond. So it's up to us to manage our project portfolio properly and to make sure that we're profitable. And uh, so there's, there's no fees. Um, just for, for clarification's sake, when you're investing in a co-op, uh, it is much easier to do it through a registered account. And so there's no additional fees uh, for them. Uh, CoPower, we do work with a third party that helps facilitate it for any registered account, an RESP, TFSA, a RIF. Um, and so there is a 50 basis point reduction that we have to pay to a third party. So in the case of a five-year bond, uh, if it's in a registered account, instead of 5% rate of return, it's 4.5%. Um, but if you're investing directly through our 
investment platform, then there is no fees to the end user. So the 5% is the net uh, rate of return. Yeah. All right, thank you. Good question. Um, I actually had one more question, if that's okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, for Ian, uh, I was actually just curious how many units you needed in order to get stuff off the ground. Well, we, two, two to 3,000 kind of residential equivalents would get us to you know, our 11 to 15 megawatt project. Uh, that's $10,000 at a time. The feedback we've received from a lot of people is that's a lot of money and that's uh, a real barrier. So we are, but we, and we put a minimum on it because we didn't have to go out and try and find 20 or 30,000 know, uh, individual investors at $1,000 each. But uh, I think what we're hearing from people is that that threshold needs to come down. So, um, you know, we encourage everyone that's interested to go on and register. And a lot of people have come and registered and they've said, look, I, I, I'm, I really I'm really interested, but that's too much money. That's fine. I think we may be bringing down our, our threshold. And we're also talking to some financial institutions about providing uh, financing as well for individuals. So, cool. yeah, so yep. Hi. Um, at the top of the evening, we were informed that with this particular type of uh, solar array and solar setup, uh, the Alberta government is relatively lax with actual regulations on the books, but obviously we have four different entities here that have all just decided to go ahead anyhow. Can you guys elaborate a little bit as to what those hurdles actually were? Maybe I could start oh. since I've been doing this probably the longest. I don't know. So I think on the, the slide, we, we started this in 2012, <laughs> so it was before the NDP even got elected. And so, um, you know, these models have been used all over the world, uh, and so it's just in Canada here, we see this as, oh, this is new. Um, and so I think the current government had in Alberta, and, and you have to keep in mind that every uh, jurisdiction has a, a, a different take on this. So if you go to Saskatchewan, it's different, BC is different, go down to the States, go to Europe, uh, it's. It, Electricity is not uh, a market-driven commodity. It's more like an infrastructure uh, type of commodity. And so it, it really depends on how the jurisdiction structures it as to you know, how much it's gonna cost and all this kind of stuff. And so it's a very complex topic, actually. Um, the government here, the, the NDP, were supposed to, and this is one of the reasons this, this seminar was timed for the date it is, uh, we were hoping to have policy announcement by the end of the year. And so we were hoping to have something to actually talk about here at this, you know, in terms of government <laughs> policy. And this is one of the challenges that I have. What I can tell you is that this works all over the world. Okay, this is the way it's moving uh, in, a, in a big way. And uh, what's great is you start to see this innovation within the marketplace where people are saying, you know what, I'm, not, I'm tired of waiting for this. We're just gonna make this happen. Because part of the problem is that you also need to create solutions as well. And that's what everyone on the stage here is trying to do. We're trying to create solutions to a problem and offer them to people. And if you agree with this solution, then we hope that you invest in it. Okay. And that's really what we're trying to do here. We're trying to help facilitate the push to this. Jennifer alluded to this in one of her slides. If all of us did this, it would have a huge potential. Okay. We're hoping to achieve it by a wildly held uh, co-op so that we have a, a large membership. That you may not all be investors, okay, but for $25, you can become part of the co-op and you can help drive that direction as well, okay? So this is the, one of the values that co-ops have is you can kind of speak to this as well. You don't even have to put in more than just your share, okay? And it's something you can own. You don't have an investment in the solar array or something like that, but you own the company that's doing that, right? And, and so it's, it's true of, of everybody on the stage here. You, you don't have to put all your money into one basket, okay? And that's, to Jennifer, she's alluded to this too, we're also trying to diversify our portfolios as well. It, it makes it easier for us to finance a lot of this stuff as well. Ian has probably the toughest job because it is, it is huge to get a, a, a large single project up off the ground. And so this, is, this requires a lot of heavy lifting and stuff. Um, uh, green bonds is a little bit more diversified. Uh, that's what we're hoping to as well, to, to offer not just a single thing, but multiple choices as well, right? And you want the timing to be, hopefully, not all occur at the same time, so you have some, some cash roll to it. You know, you're, you're starting one project, you're finishing one, you're starting another one. You know, one's big, one's medium, one's small. You, you want this kind of all mix. Um, it, it really helps. It's, but I don't know if they can answer your question. But, but, but we're really waiting for the government to come up with it because it's just, to get back to your question, I think this is 
purely driven by government policy, okay? Whether this is profitable or not is, is purely government policy. And it doesn't matter which part of the world you're in. It, that is true of it, okay? It's well, in Ontario, it's far more predictable. They've had a FIT program there, which if you can't make money on a FIT program, you're not very bright. Um, <laughs> And, and so that really helps. It really does help, okay? And they did that deliberately because it is a great way to guarantee it, okay? And be, but unfortunately, because of some other things that have happened peripheral to it, um, it's gotten a bad reputation. So the local government here has decided that we're not going to do a fit. But there's lots of other options. There's lots of other ways to do this, okay? At the end of the day, it has to make money, okay? And so if we can't make money in this in Alberta, we won't be offering investments because we're a for-profit co-op. And if you want to make an investment, we expect a return on your investment, okay, to, right. to go back to you. This is not a charity. No, if, you yeah. want to, if you want to throw your money away and just put throw solar panels all over the place, you're welcome to do that. You can go anywhere and buy solar panels and hand them out to people. And, you know, there you get solar <laughs> in the ground. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about actual investments. Will you give us a thousand bucks and will you give you a thousand bucks back plus a little bit of extra cash in your pocket? And, and that's really what this is about. And it just wasn't quite profitable outside of government intervention until recently? That's pretty much what I'm hearing then? Well, if you look at the retail price of electricity in Alberta, it's, you know, three, four cents a kilowatt hour. Um, yeah, you can't make money at that. You can't make money at that if you built a coal plant today. Okay. You can't make money at that on any generation, not just renewables. Okay. So there's, that's why there's no generation yeah. being built in Alberta. Okay. Um, it hasn't been for quite a while. So just right. to this add is why I was for the group. Yeah. Yeah. No, so just to add into that, um, yeah, the, the wholesale market in Alberta right now has been quite overbuilt, um, and so there's a lot of glut of um, supply, um, and and the forecasts have not been the greatest over the past, and so we actually have a whole bunch of assets on the market that are are not necessarily needed, um, and so for that reason, the the price of electricity in the wholesale market has been quite low as of late. And so what I've been hearing from a lot of other developers um, is that at that price, it's, it's been very difficult to, to develop um, DG projects. Um, and I know um, one potential tool that might be useful, and, and it has been actually used um, through the Renewable Electricity Program, um, the REF, which was recently announced for round one, um, that, that announced um, a successful bid for, I think it was 600 megawatts um, of, of utility scale renewables. They used an indexed REC. So essentially, um, the value is fixed, um, and then regardless of whatever value the wholesale or whatever the wholesale value was, um, the the government would use the carbon levy money to fill the rest in. But as soon as the the price the wholesale value went above that, they would actually pay the government. Um, and so that that is a potential long term tool. I, I don't know where that is on. I don't I don't think that it applies right now to distributed generation. Um, but I'm actually curious, Ian, as to how um, your group is looking at um, establishing long-term revenue security without um, a standard offer program or a fit or, um, yeah. yeah. If they can comment on that. Sure. Can we answer your question or? Well, like we're getting there. Everyone has a different <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, I guess my, my take on it, I mean, the regulatory environment is, I mean, it's it's complicated, uh, but you can do it. As you can see, there's a number of different models where, where we think we can do it now. But, um, you know, if it, in the absence of a government subsidy, you know, the economics have to work. And the combination of extremely low wholesale power prices over the last three years, um, um, which which is now changing, and that's so that's one of the converging factors. We've got power prices going up. We've got the cost of solar dr coming down dramatically, and we've got carbon taxes, which is you know an internalization of, of an external cost. And those things all coming together are starting to make these models, which probably three years ago wouldn't have even been close to being economic, economic, uh, at least in our case. So, uh, so yeah, go I mean, government uh, and regulatory policy is not super supportive. They're getting there, and this review is part of it. Um, but we've found ways to make it work within, within the existing policy. But the economics are getting better. Uh, yep. Uh, <laughs> Hi. Uh, yeah, so this is for all of you guys, uh, whatever you want to comment. I'm just wondering, 
If a person's interested in starting a community-based solar project, I guess the very first thing is uh, what are the w ways that you could access uh, funding and perhaps um, also for financing and, and different models to kind of try and get some of these projects off the ground? Okay. Um, sure. I'll jump right in there. Um, so in terms of the funding, um, there are a whole lot of upfront uh, grants that are available through the government of Alberta um, that so they'll they'll oftentimes help reduce that initial in, um, cost of installation, um, but that doesn't reflect or that wouldn't act as a long term subsidy or long term kind of revenue certainty for the cost of electricity, right? So that's that's a difference. You can you can provide government funding initially or over the lifetime of the project, um, and there is a lot available um, for that first one. Um, now specifically, if you're looking at community energy that is within the microgeneration framework, so attached onto a school or community hall or um, an apartment building, for example, or a mall that has a load, um, there are a whole lot of funds that are currently available for, the, for it. Um, specifically, I know um, in Edmonton, the, the Edmonton Federation of Community Leagues, um, they, they have some very good funding that's available through the city of Edmonton um, that they've been able to access on top of provincial government funding, and so that's been a, that's been quite helpful in terms of reducing costs for them. But, but you can certainly step back and s so right now we're, we're looking at a rebate program in Alberta for residential commercial stuff like that. We're talking about a community energy generation policy from the government. You, you can go back out uh, 20 years um, and projects used to happen 20 years ago through a mechanism known as a power purchase agreement. We've mentioned this in some of the slides. Uh, people maybe don't appreciate that but in the good old days, people would pay what would consider to be a, a crazy power, a price for power, okay? And it was for lots of other reasons besides the price of electricity, okay? Some people just wanted to kickstart the industry. Some people wanted to do it for the environmental um, attributes of it. There's lots of things that you can do. And so we can still do that. And it's one of the things we're looking at at the co-op is that if the policy just drags on and drags on and drags on, maybe there are early partners will just enter into a power purchase agreement with us and we'll just do it the old fashioned way. And, and so there's, there's lots of ways to skin this cat. Um, but I think to be fair, um, most people would like to see the, the government step up and do their share too. And a lot of it is not money, it's just regulations. You know? And so, especially when you're doing long-term investments, you wanna know that it's fairly predictable landscape. Uh, okay. That makes sense. Yep. From the co-op's point of view, we're not planning on, on sticking with a particular supplier, we're actually hoping to tender out all, publicly tender out all of our projects and stuff. So we'll work two ways. We'll either a property manager will come to us and say, we have this building, we'd like to put solar on it, or we could have an uh, installer come to us and say, well, I have this project, could you finance it for us? And so we can do both. Okay, I think we'll take one more question. Uh, uh, thank you for all the speaker on the uh, informative uh, presentation. So I think I have a, pre uh, I have a question regarding the uh, carbon dioxide offset sales uh, mentioned in one of the presentation. And uh, could you elaborate on that to see um, how, how uh, what's the uh, program about and how can um, a solar program be benefit from um, such, um, such sales? Uh, I think the, uh, the second question would be uh, if uh, as a project, if you sell back to the Alberta Power Pool, uh, what would be the uh, average uh, sales price of the uh, uh, per kilowatt hour. Sure. So it, in our case, part of the revenue stream, is, as you point out, is, is CO2 offset sales. So under Alberta regulations currently, some new regulations just came out in, in January 1st, um, or took effect January 1st, but basically right now as a, re as a renewable resource, you generate uh, an offset equal to the equivalent grid intensity in the Alberta system. So for distribution connected uh, renewable generation right now, I think it's 0.64 tons per megawatt hour. Uh, and you basically have the opportunity to do that for 13 years. And then after that, you can opt in to what's called the output based allocation system, which uh, is established right now with a grid intensity of 0.37 tons per megawatt hour and it starts to go down by 1% a year starting in 2020. So what does that mean? So in, uh, your, let's say in 2019, we're generating, every megawatt hour we generate, we will basically generate 
1.64 tons of carbon offsets. In 2019 in Alberta, that's going to be priced at $30 per megawatt hour. And then um, under the federal program, it goes to 30 in 2020, 40 in 2021, and $50 in 2022. So 30 right now, rising up to $50 per ton. So our project will generate 0 0.6 times 30, 40, or $50, whatever the price is. Let's say it's 2022, we'll generate 0 0.6 times $50, so $30 per megawatt hour effectively in CO2 uh, offset revenues. And that there, there is, and, and, and presumably there will be an, an even more liquid market for those offsets as there, as there are more you know, large final emitters that need to, to uh, retire, procure and retire those or pay penalties into the fund. So uh, our plan is just to sell those offsets uh, or emissions performance credits to those large final emitters. Um, and your other question was wholesale power prices in Alberta, very unpredictable. They've been very volatile in the past. Uh, it's hard to say what they will be, but historically, uh, you know, Alberta power prices have settled you know, about $60 per megawatt hour on a seven by 24 all hours basis. Um, you know, forecasts for the future typically look like around that price level. Um, the Alberta market's transitioning to a new capacity market, which might have implications on the value of energy. Um, but um, you know, forecasting is always tough, but you know, 50 to $60 a megawatt hour represents you know, probably the cost of the new entry and it's probably a reasonable proxy for a real price going forward. Any other comments? Yeah, I mean, you know, what we're trying to do here is predict the future. And that's one of the challenges. So when you ask us a question, we're trying to answer it intelligently, but it's a, there's a little waffle factor in there because we, we really can't really predict. And as an investor, um, you know that going in. You're, you're taking a risk with your money, and you're just deciding that you'd rather take the risk and put your money where you would like it to be rather than you know take your risk on oil and gas. So you have to appreciate that we're not the only energy uh, stocks that are at risk. If for whatever reason they decide that uh, they're going to limit extraction of uh, oil, for instance, and put it, leave it in the ground, which is uh, some some organizations are advocating for that. Then all of a sudden, you could imagine that uh, Exxon's share price is going to tank because uh, their price, oil and gas companies' share price, is based on proven reserves. So if you've got, you know, a million barrels of, bar of oil in the ground and you're not allowed to take it out, then all of a sudden your s shares are kind of worthless, and that could happen in the next 20 years, who knows, right? Maybe in 30 years or something. So there's, they have a risk too, okay? And so, so this is something you have to keep in mind as well, right? Is we're trying to you know, look into the future and say, you know, what's gonna happen, right? You have a couple more Hurricane Harveys, um, who knows what that does to the landscape, right? Does that make sense? So, uh, just one last comment, Rob. In, in our case, I mean, the way we've set up the model is you you consume your own electricity at a fixed price of six and a half cents per kilowatt hour. So that that's a big risk mitigant that takes you know a lot of the uncertainty out of it. Uh, you're going to consume you know your whatever eight thousand kilowatt hours a year anyway at your home. Uh, so why not own the generation and hedge yourself for the next twenty five years? And then prices doesn't matter what prices. Thank you very much, all of you. It's wonderful. <laughs>